soil is either rich or sterile, depending on whether or not it favors the development of the fauna that live and proliferate in its depths. The landscapes below ground are just as varied as those up above. Within the space of a kilometer, they tell completely different stories to this soil expert, pedologist Bernard Jabiol. With a given topography, given climate, given life conditions, given period of evolution, all those things together mean that soil is going to vary greatly from one spot to the next. Sometimes there's an evolution within the space of about 10 meters. Sometimes we see very visible evolutions within the space of several hundred kilometers. But on the global scale, we find a great diversity of soils and therefore a great diversity of properties belonging to them. Bernard Jabillot leaves his study pit in the forest to walk 800 meters over to one of his colleagues' pits in a field of grain. Look at you, Joel. Your pit's really deep. Less than a kilometer away up there, I was in the forest and there were only 50 centimeters. Why is it so thick here? Earlier you were uphill on the slope, so the soil wasn't very thick and it was on limestone. Here we're downhill with very thick soil that's over a meter and a half deep. Why? Because there was erosion up on the slope with an accumulation of deposits at the bottom of the valley. This soil has strong agricultural potential and good depth, which means large water reserves and large mineral reserves. Because there are no obstacles, roots can easily grow to depths of one or one and a half meters. It's also healthy soil with strong biological activity and with earthworms that travel back and forth from the depths to the surface. The soil's depth and structure determine its capacity to store water. For the animal life, a heavy rain is the equivalent of a tsunami. The water dissolves organic matter on the surface and washes it below as it trickles down the tunnels dug by earthworms. Once it reaches the impermeable layers, like certain clays, water accumulates and forms underground reservoirs. Bernard Jabiol and Joël Michelin have traveled about 20 kilometers away to visit a third pit, dug in an area with few trees. The soil here is very different from that in the previous pits. The soil here resembles the cultivated soil we saw. The quality is very loose, it's easy to push into, and yet at the same time, it's very deep. But it's sandy soil. Right, it's sedimentary. The sand was deposited by the sea several tens of millions of years ago, and that's what the soil is currently developing in. Sand has two major drawbacks. The first one is acidity. In other words, the absence of nutritional elements. What's more, this acidity is hostile to the activity of earthworms. They can't live here. So none of the organic matter provided by the vegetation gets mixed into the soil. It simply accumulates up on the surface. The second major drawback is that the water drains very quickly. The soil can't store water. It doesn't have any reserves. This soil is very dry in the summer. In conclusion, there are two major constraints for vegetation. Acidity and dryness. Nevertheless, these impoverished, dry, acidic soils in which no earthworm can survive are not completely sterile.
Rustic plants adapted to harsh conditions grow on the surface. In the litter, we find springtails, roundworms, and other habitual decomposers. Luckily, there's bacteria in the dirt. With no earthworms around, this is what imparts a bit of fertility to the soil. Bacteria are composed of microorganisms that are invisible to the naked eye, but they replicate so quickly and multiply at such a pace that they wind up saturating the soil, be it fertile or poor. Because of their density, bacteria are also an essential element when it comes to soil dynamics. Lionel Rangard and his team from the National Institute of Agricultural Research, the INRA, take samples of bacteria contained in different soils to make up a sort of conservatory for microorganisms. When you study microorganisms in soil, you generally look at the first 20 centimeters, which correspond more or less to the height of the auger, since the superficial layer of soil actually contains the most and greatest diversity of microbial organisms. For example, in one gram of soil, which is a tiny amount, you have over a billion bacteria, and within this billion there are millions of different kinds. The reservoir of microbial diversity in the soil is found in this upper layer. To give you another example, if we look on the scale of a plot of land like this, sub-prairie, there is more living microbial mass under the ground than there is living mass above it, even if we include all the plant clover and add in livestock such as 10 cows per hectare or 50 sheep. So it's no exaggeration to say that when conditions are favorable, there's as much life deep down in the soil as up on the surface. The sample taken by Lionel Rangard's team is examined under an electronic microscope. It reveals how bacteria are organized within their habitat. Thinner than a hair's breadth, the bacteria lodge in the tiny instances of bits of earth. These spaces are so restricted that their predators, the bulky protozoa, are too big to get in. Sheltered away, the bacteria shift into a slow motion lifestyle that allows them to conserve energy. Earthworms, if there are any present in the soil, can shake them from their torpor as they pass by. The mucus secreted by the worms and the oxygen they convey through their tunnels stimulate the bacteria. Active once more, the bacteria transform organic matter into the mineral salts that are indispensable for plant growth. Bacteria are able to break down and mineralize the organic matter that finds its way into the soil to transform it into mineral matter, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, etc. This mineral matter is what provides nutrition for the plants. So bacteria are deeply implicated in soil fertility. To assess the impact of bacteria on soil fertility, the INRA has built a completely automated experimental platform. Plant development is measured under highly controlled conditions. Lionel Rongard's team grow flats of alfalfa in pots of soil where the number and diversity of bacteria are controlled and measured. 
After six weeks of cultivation, we see the alfalfa in normal soil has grown well, but its growth is much slower in the soil where the diversity of bacteria has been reduced. What about these two pots where the alfalfa seems more developed than in the two preceding pots? It's exactly the same experiment, except here the plants have been sprayed with fertilizer. So we see increased growth linked to that. And despite the addition of fertilizer, we continue to see a major difference in growth, with a plant that grows less when there are fewer kinds of bacteria. The experiment shows that bacteria have a crucial influence on soil fertility. The more bacteria soil contains, the more fertile it is, whether or not fertilizer is added. The scientists also note an important correlation. Soil fertility differs according to the type of bacteria present. Each soil contains a sort of genetic image of its microbial diversity and abundance, an image of its bacterial diversity. Why? Because bacterial diversity depends on the type of soil, its chemical physics, climate, as well as its historical use, whether it was agricultural, forest or urban. Each soil has a unique image in terms of microbiology. In a way, the microorganisms present in a given soil give it its identity. Currently, the INRA team has genetically identified and analyzed over 10,000 samples. These samples are kept on file. Each will be used as reference to understand the evolution of soil over time. We're a long way from a complete inventory of the interactions between bacteria and plants. For example, we've discovered that partnerships between plants and bacteria are forged at the root level. We have three experimental systems that let us observe the root development of three different plants, clover, pea, and rapeseed. We see root architectures or developments that differ greatly from plant to plant, depending on density as well as their ability to grow deep. If we look more closely at the roots of the pea and clover, which are legumes, we see little bulbs on the roots called nodules. These nodules contain thousands of bacteria of the same strain, rhizobia. The plant raises the bacteria by nourishing them with sap, and in exchange, the bacteria fix nitrogen from the atmosphere to make it easy to assimilate directly by the plant. We have a symbiotic relationship where each partner maintains a beneficial report with the other, which increases the biological fertility of the soil for plant development. I give you what you don't have and you bring me what I lack. Bacteria and roots enjoy a give-and-take relationship where each feeds the other for their own benefit. 